We're live. Hey, welcome to Healthcare Triage Live. I think we're live. Um, we try to do this every once, we're trying to do this now once a week. We're trying to get a regular time. Um, and we appreciate the many, many, many questions that people put in the comments uh, ahead of time for today's show, which, which let us sort of cue them up so you'll be able to see them ahead of time. Um, however, many of these questions are just pumping in right this second. So a lot of these will be, uh, we'll see if I know the answers and you will hear me say I don't know if I don't. Um, but this is our weekly show where we try to answer many of your questions live. You can try tweeting them to the Healthcare Triage account, but even better, you can put them in the comments section of this video. Um, afterwards, this video will still remain up and you can watch it, but don't continue to put questions in the comments section for this video. Put them in next week's Healthcare Triage Live. Uh, once we shut down today, we're not gonna pull any more questions from the comments below. But for the moment, you know, feel free to keep going. Um, I've been asked by um, our uh, technical expert and now lawyer, Mark, to remind you that we're not giving medical advice on this show. Um, that you should not take anything I say and go out and do it. If there's any actual medical questions, you should talk to your doctor. Um, and you should, look at this. You should get, uh, sorry, I was just distracted by a picture right here. Um, you should get medical advice from your doctor. But let's stop with all of this and begin. First question from Data Pirate. Is there an ethical way to harness the placebo effect? What are your thoughts on placebo surgeries or sugar pills that actually increase a patient's sense of well-being? Of course it's ethical to use a placebo effect. We do it every day. Um, anytime you give your kid a hug and a kiss on the boo-boo and tell them that it's gonna be better, you're of course using the placebo effect all the time. You know, when my kids have rashes, we will put like moisturizer on it and tell them it's cream that's gonna help it make better. Um, even if they have pain, you put a Band-Aid on it to make it feel better. That's placebo effect. Uh, if you're asking if we can medicalize it and charge people for it, that's another story. And charging people for it especially is where it gets squirrely. Um, but there are many things that even doctors do every day that it's placebo, you know, whether it's, you know, consoling someone if they're in pain or, you know, sympathizing or a lot of those things help um, even if they're not. And every therapy that we give out, as we talked about in our episode on the placebo effect, has both a biologic and a placebo effect. The question is always, is the biologic effect greater than the placebo effect or how much is the relative contribution? Um, surgeries, well, now you're actually potentially giving people harm um, and so a placebo surgery is a little more complicated, but, uh, but you know, we should not be under the illusion that we're not using the placebo effect in everyday medicine all of the time, because we are. Next question from Jonesy Banana. I often chew a lot of sugar-free gum when studying to prevent myself grazing on junk food. Are there any potential downsides of this, especially dental or to the jaw itself? You will see lots of um, sites will try to tell you that the, the artificial sweeteners are dangerous, and they're not. Watch our episode on artificial sweeteners. Um, but, um, and you'll actually even see groups like the ADA, um, the American Dental Association, uh, promote the use of, um, of sugar-free gum because it increases saliva and it actually can pull some of the bad bacteria off the teeth. Um, it shouldn't replace brushing, but it actually can reduce the chance of getting a cavity in some ways. Um, and so, there are not many downsides. I don't know of any long-term downsides effects, specifically the jaw. Of course, if your jaw gets tired, stop. You know, as with anything, if your body's giving you a signal that something is bothering you, don't keep doing it. Uh, but um, no, sugar-free gum is actually might might be on the side of things where it, it helps, not harms. Uh, and so there really is no good reason to keep avoiding it. Next question comes from Benjamin Alexander. He said, in the guns and physicians vid, you said get a physical every year. I remember you told John Green elsewhere that annual physicals for men are probably not necessary. Can you elaborate? Yes, I can. Most of what I was talking about in that video is about kids, because um, I'm a pediatrician, and we talk specifically about anticipatory guidance and protecting kids, it's suicide and things like that. And with, with respect to children, that they should be having at least annual physicals, especially when they're babies and younger, even more often. We have to do vaccines. Um, we have to do a lot of parenting uh, advice. We have to do a lot of behavioral talk. You know, wh when, where do parents learn to be good parents? Where do they ask their questions? The pediatrician's office is mostly, most often the best thing. Tons of anticipatory guidance about injury prevention is performed in the physician's office. A lot of the stuff you gotta, you know, talk parents through developmentally and check if kids are developing normally and screen them for developmental delays and for autism and for ADHD and for everything else you wanna do. A lot of this happens in 
the yearly visit for, for pediatrics. Could we do a better job at being more effective and efficient in the pediatric well care visit? Absolutely. Um, I, for one, would like to see less of a focus on the physical exam and more of a focus on parenting. Um, that's me. I was just talking about that this weekend uh, at the Pediatric Academic Society meeting with a lot of my colleagues. But um, with respect to adults, it, it, you know, it's not as clear how much of a benefit the annual physical exam is giving, especially for males who are young um, in their 20s and 30s. Um, that's what we were talking about with John, because John is a, you know, a male in his 20s or 30s. Um, and so for him, perhaps uh, a physical exam wouldn't. But for children, which is what that video is about, yes, they are different. Thus my elaboration. Question four from Dash 574. How are you able to keep up with all the new research on such a wide range of topics? And how do you make any judgments on areas of conflicting research? Well, we employ about 40 people whose job it is specifically to review the literature at all times and feed it to me. No, I'm joking. Um, I do a lot of reading. I don't know. I mean, part of it is that is my job. I am, you know, I'm not as much, I do do a little bit of practice in pediatrics, but the vast majority of my job is I'm a health services researcher. This is what I do. Um, and I actually consider it part of my service obligation to, to, to do a lot of the writing that I do, whether it be on the blog in the New York Times or other places at Academy Health, at JAMA, to talk about what does research mean. So I read a lot. Uh, of the medical literature, and I try to consume it that. And the more that you do something, the better that you get at it. Um, so with practice, I've gotten better at sort of reading and digesting papers and new research, and I, I get sort of methods. That's, again, that's what I do. So this is my area of expertise. Um, how do I make any judgments on areas of conflicting research? I try to be Bayesian. That's a big word, but you should watch our, our uh, video on Bayesian analysis, where, in other words, I try to know this is the body of literature that has come before, and therefore, you know, it pushes us in one direction or another to believe something is true or not. And when a new piece of evidence comes along, it has to be weighed along with that. So if you have if we have 52,000 studies showing us that autism you know, and, and vaccines aren't related, even if there was one more tiny study that all of a sudden proved that it was, it wouldn't counter all that previous research. You have to take it in line with it. So this is why I often think continuing to do studies in that area is somewhat questionable, because it's like at this point, the overwhelming evidence shows us what is truth. And each new study adds to it in a tiny way. Of course, when we can have a systematic review or a meta-analysis, more videos for you to watch. Um, those are the ways of, of gathering all the research together and then sort of weighing the sum total of it. And when those kinds of things are available, you'll notice I favor them uh, because those are good ways of trying to, to look at what all the little studies together tell us in aggregate. Next question. Jonathan Blackwell, what are your thoughts on Accutane, isotretinoin, and its continued use on people as an acne medication? So. Um, Isoretinoin is, what is it, um, isotretinoin, it's so hard to keep saying that, so we'll say Accutane. Um, Accutane is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenally powerful and successful drug in curing some uh, very, uh, some types of acne that are very hard to get rid of. Um, and it works very well in certain populations. The problem was that it, um, there have been later links uh, that it might be causing some bowel issues and uh, and some depression or suicide, all of which can sort of be watched and managed. But um, I think it was Roche, when they lost a big case about Accutane uh, to some people who'd had bowel issues, they pulled it from the market. So Accutane's actually gone in the United States. Um, other forms of isotretinoin are still around. Um, and there are people that will argue it's incredibly powerful and useful, but you have to monitor the side effects. But all drugs have side effects. Um, and so this is not one of those where you know I'm like, oh my god, it's terrible. Nobody should ever use it. Uh, I understand when, when it is used by some doctors uh, because it is a powerful drug for removing very, you know, acne that's hard to get rid of. Uh, but, of course, as I said at the beginning, that's a decision to be made with your doctor. Um, and it has to be used carefully and under the close observation of a physician to make sure that none of the bad side effects or things that occur are happening. Next question from Arts Freak. Do we know anything about brain freezes? What causes them, how to prevent them, and how to stop them once they've happened? Well, it's not, you know, it's not your brain freezing. It's not. Um, and what causes them? Is, isn't it eating cold stuff? I, I don't even know what else would cause them. But, um, so, you know, if you're eating cold stuff really fast, and all of a sudden you sort of get that intense headache. That is, 
I think it's about the speed of the cold. In other words, if you introduce something cold very quickly, um, it's just such a difference um, in, uh, in temperature that maybe it affects the blood flow or the nerves or something like that. How do you avoid it? Don't eat super cold things really super fast. How do you stop it you know, once it's happened? I think just wait. Uh, you know, it'll get better. It always does for me. I don't think this is anything that's been studied closely. Now that as I'm saying that, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it has. I will have to go look it up. It's possible someone's done good research on brain freezes. I just don't think it's been one of those things that no one's worried about the long-term, you know, chronic brain freezes or that the pain sticks around. I'm pretty sure it just almost, it always goes away. So I don't know how much research has been done, but I'll look it up. Next question. Junior Uval, can you talk about ozone therapy and aloe vera products such as Forever Living products? Both are promoted as miracle treatments. Any research, any results, your opinion? Pff, forever Living product. I mean, anything that's promoted as a Forever Living product, I would I'd be skeptical right there. Ozone therapy is like, there's nothing. There's no science or anyone knowing anything behind that working at all. Um, it just doesn't exist as far as I know. Um, with respect to aloe vera, aloe vera does work. Aloe vera is one of those things that actually in, in one of our myth books, it's one of the few things that, that actually works well. It was one of the very times when like, you know, we were actually able to say the myth works. They've done randomized controlled trials looking at burns um, and to see whether uh, they, they heal faster with the use of aloe vera versus other things. And it turns out that aloe vera actually performs better than many other things that we use as medications. Um, and so for burns and for healing, mild burns, mind you, aloe vera actually does work. Now, if you're talking about, are they using it for anything different, like ingesting it? Um, that's crazy. And is aloe vera a miracle? No. I mean, you know, it's a good, it's a reasonably good therapy for treating burns, but it's not miraculous. Like the burn doesn't disappear. Um, so there is research in aloe vera. There is, I think, I'm not sure if there's much research on ozone, but what does exist shows that there's no association or really that it's doing much good at all. So I don't understand sort of why people are doing the ozone therapy. I do understand why people use aloe vera for, the, for what it's intended. If you're using it for other purposes or if they're promoting it, then no, probably not much evidence at all. Daniel Hoxson, what's the actual research on best hand washing practices, length of time, best type of cleanser, water temperature? Okay, so you know they've done some stuff. Well, first of all, we shouldn't deem it. If you're gonna wash your hands, that's great. Let's start with that. Um, you know, I'm not gonna demonize you because you're not washing it right. Washing your hands is great. You know, it's a good way to prevent, uh, you know, infectious diseases from spreading around and things like that. So um, if you go to the CDC, they have this poster, um, which I've seen before, which talks about it. And it's, it's pretty intense because it's like, it's the whole thing. You're supposed to do this, then 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 you're supposed to do It's like, it's crazy. Um, and it's supposed to take a minute um, and that's basically supposed to make sure that you get it. And they're all the way to the end where, you know, you're supposed to dry your hands, then use the paper towel to turn off. It's intense. Um, I don't know that there's, you know, probably half a minute to a minute is great. More is longer. There's probably diminishing returns at some point. Um, the washing and the, the scrubbing is more important than the soap. Um, so don't think it's like, oh, soap and not. The washing, the scrubbing, the trying to physically get the stuff off, important. Um, that's what you really want to focus on. Um, and you don't want to do it for five seconds. You want to make sure that you have enough time to really get every inch of your hand. That probably takes about 30, 45, 50, you know, maybe 60 seconds. Um, the temperature, what, whatever feels good on your hands. I don't think that the colds or the hot actually makes that much of a difference. Um, and for the types of cleanser, you know, soap, antibacterial soap, of course, if you've watched that episode, not they're taking that stuff off the, uh, the market. That doesn't really work that well. Remember, the tons of germs are not, you know, the, first of all, need bacteria. I mean, they're not bacteria and need like an antibiotic. Um, lots of them are not. Uh, you don't need that antibacterial or that, you know, antibactericidal component. Uh, it's being removed from lots of products right now. Uh, soap and water. Soap and water works great. Next question, Kate D. Can you talk about what adults who have had their vaccinations as kids should do in areas where there are measles outbreaks? I don't think much at all. You know, if you've had the full set of, of you know, MMRs all the way up through like, you know, adolescence, you're pretty much considered, I think, good through adulthood. We're not at this point, as far as I know, recommending any kind of boosters for people that have had the full set of shots. Of course, if you're born before 1957, um, you're pretty much assumed to have been exposed to measles and immune. Uh, Cause back then, of course it was, 
it was much more rampant. But you know, as long as you've had the full set of shots, you're good. Um, if you haven't, then you should talk to your doctor because then as adults, they do want you to get like two or three, maybe one or two or three, I can't remember exactly what it is, but they do want you to get the shots to complete the immunization. Um, but if you have had the vaccinations as kids, as this, uh, as Kate D asks, then you should be good. But as always, talk to your doctor and make sure what I'm saying is true. Next question, Terrytown. How can a hypochondriac like myself, um, I'm gonna change your question because I don't understand, do from having it. So what can you do about your anxiety attacks and annoying your doctor? How can we separate real pain from psychosomatic pain? Psychosomatic pain is real pain. Let's, you know, first of all, let's own that. You know, when someone has butterflies in their stomach, they actually feel, it may be caused by nerves, but it feels real. Um, when you feel nauseous because of being afraid, that is real nausea. Um, and so psychosomatic, it doesn't matter what the pain is caused by, that is pain. We need to treat it. Now, there's a question between treating it with drugs that are like attacking you know, certain nerves and pathways and treating it with drugs that maybe help anxiety and we have to treat the cause of the pain. Um, so what is my, so what the question is, what, what can you do? Well, if you think you're having anxiety attacks and annoying your doctor, I'm less concerned about annoying your doctor than the fact that you're having anxiety attacks which are reducing your quality of life. Um, you should talk to your doctor about the anxiety attacks. Um, perhaps you would benefit from you know, therapy as well, from working with a psychi psychologist or a psychiatrist. It may be that medication um, is necessary. The problem is that we often treat pain as pain as pain, and therefore everybody gets put on a pain med. And in this case, maybe a pain med wouldn't help. You need to treat, again, the cause of the pain. So that's probably what you should do. But again, that's borderline medical advice. You should be talking to your doctor about that. Next question. Jonathan Schroeder, my wife and daughter have celiac disease and we're planning another child. Should we introduce our new child to gluten early? No one knows on this one. I'm pretty sure there were two really good trials in the New England Journal of Medicine that I can remember in recent years, which actually looked at whether the early introduction of gluten for kids at high risk for celiac disease were more or less likely to develop celiac disease. And the answer was it didn't really make a difference at all one way or the other. I think one of them was even placebo control. Um, introducing kids early to gluten did not seem to make it more or less likely that they would get celiac disease. Some of them got it, some of them did not. Breastfeeding also didn't seem to make much of a difference either, if I remember correctly. So I'm not telling you to do it, I'm not telling you to avoid it. I don't think anybody knows or anybody you know, can really tell you that it's good or bad, but you should talk to your doctor, you should talk to your pediatrician and see how they feel about it as well. But that's what the research tells us. Noah Hawk. What is your stance on moderate alcohol consumption by pregnant and breastfeeding mothers? Is there any available research? Oh, Noah Hawk, you really want to make my life hard. Um, okay, so you know, if you open up the news, you're going to see articles going crazy one way or the other on this. They'll tell you research shows that you know light drinking is not associated with difficulty, and this research shows you that light is you know moderate or light, so light drinking is associated with problems. And this one will say not behavioral problems. This one will say it makes things better. This one will say it's worse. None of them are randomized controlled trials, of course, because it would be completely unethical to randomize mothers to get alcohol at this point to see if we could screw up their children. No one's going to do that study, at least not in any reputable country. Um, so we're not going to have a great answer. We're going to have lots of association studies, cohort studies, case control studies. and. They're all over the map. Um, I think that, you know, the problem is we don't know what the okay dose is. It's very clear that lots of drinking is bad. It's very clear that, you know, drinking even moderate to high levels is probably isn't good. You know, the question is what is the point at which it becomes okay? Nobody knows. And so the advice that doctors give out is, is just don't do it because the risk benefit just seem too high. You know, the, the benefit to be gained uh, by, by even mild drinking during pregnancy seems not high enough for most mothers, at least almost every mother I know, to, to overwhelm the possible damage to a child. Um, having said that, there are many, many, many mothers who probably engage in light drinking and have kids that turn out just fine, if not great. Um, and so, uh, what is my feeling? It's like I wish there was research and I wish, or I wish that we had great answers from research and we don't. Um, the available research is conflicting um, and many people make choices based on their own preferences um, and you know, the vast majority of them do just fine. Uh, but your doctor will likely tell you don't do it um, as will probably you know, 
most doctors I know. Okay, but with breastfeeding, you know, there, there is no question that alcohol is getting in the milk. Um, that happens. So, uh, you, you know, we, there, are, there are studies that try to tell people, you know, even if you wait a while, the, the alcohol gets into the breast milk. So um, there's less of a chance of, uh, you know, causing, you know, developmental damage from that because uh, we're really, you're not going to get fetal alcohol syndrome from that. But if you wouldn't feed your kid alcohol, you wouldn't feed him alcohol in the breast milk. Um, and so most people will tell you why you're breastfeeding to be very conscious uh, and not, uh, not, not so much with the breastfeeding either. Next question uh, comes from Anthrax Records. How do you feel about the CHIP program? Seems to me like it ensures a lot of kids at a very low price can be expanded. I love the CHIP program. The chip, I've written in the New York Times about it. I think we, did we do it? We did a healthcare triage in this one. Did we do one on CHIP? Maybe not. Maybe that's a good topic, but we've definitely done, I've definitely written about it many times uh, in the blog in the New York Times. So the CHIP program is awesome, so much so that when we passed the Affordable Care Act, you know, that was really aimed at adults because we had already really reduced the problem of uninsurance in the United States for children. Underinsurance is still a problem, but many, many children, many children were, were improved, had improved coverage because of changes in the CHIP program. The, the CHIP program is the Children's Health Insurance pro Program, um, and it was passed to expand Medicaid, uh, or to expand what we would consider Medicaid for many children in the United States. It was done you know, a decade and a half or two decades ago, and it's been very successful. It, it has an incredibly high actuarial value, um, such that you know, kids who are on CHIP pay very little out of pocket. There are many people that are concerned that ending CHIP would hurt a lot of kids because it would result in their getting insurance products that actually would have a much lower actuarial value with a lot more cost sharing, lead to a lot more underinsurance. Um, but the recent doc fix that we talked about in a healthcare triage news like a week or two ago also included a two-year extension of the CHIP program. So we're good for two more years. Um, we could expand it. I don't think expansion is going to happen because at this point uh, we believe that between CHIP and the Affordable Care Act, children are, are you know, much better covered than they used to be. Um, I think the concern over time is are we going to allow uh, for CHIP to go away and what that would mean for kids, but I, I don't see expansion happening anytime soon. Next question, Dan Falvo. Covi uh, codeine is available over the counter in most other countries. Why is that not the case in the U.S.? That's not true. Codeine is not available in most other countries. Um, it's available in some countries. I think you can get it in low doses if I remember when I last looked at this. In Denmark, maybe Canada, um, UK, Sri Lanka. But you know, we're not talking about every country. In fact, I think in most countries it might not. And if, if it is available, it's available in, in, with other things like, you know, like a Tylenol with codeine. Um, or for the British, paracetamol and codeine. Um, but it's not like you're going out and buying, you know, codeine by itself for the most part. Uh, why is it not available in the United States? Because we don't let anything almost be over the counter in the United States. Our antibiotics are, you know, over, you know, over the counter at this point. You know, if you, if you want to get, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking. Ephedrine. You gotta, you know, you gotta talk to the pharmacists at this point. So. Um, you know, we, we, marijuana is not even legal um, in most of the United States, even for medicinal purposes. So the idea that codeine was going to become over the counter is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, we also have a real problem with opiate addiction and everything else. So that trend just ain't happening. But I think it's a misrepresentation to say it's available over the counter in most other countries, some countries, um, but not. So the United States in this case, not a real outlier. outlier. Next question, Fabrizio Gonzalez. How do you... Feel the field of mental illness, specifically depression, anxiety disorders, and so on, has changed since you became a pediatrician. It's gotten better um, because, if, for no other reason than we've gotten mental, we've gotten parity in the United States, or much closer to parity with respect to health insurance coverage. When I was starting, you know, physical disease was covered very well. Mental disease, you had to have super awesome insurance. But these days, you know, insurance is, is by definition supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, doing both, uh, covering both equally. So it is gotten much better, if for that reason or no other. There's also a lot more medications than there used to be to help treat a lot of mental illnesses, so I like to think that, that things have gotten better. Next question, Life Teen 2, does long-term use of prescription amphetamines affect cardiac or mental health or later in life? Why are you... Okay, I see what you're asking, yes. So, um, I was gonna ask why are you doing that, but of course, yeah, now I'm gonna get it. So the, the question is, 
you know, will you know, long-term amphetamine use affect cardiac or mental health? There's not a lot of evidence for that. Um, of course, it depends if you're abusing it or using it as prescribed. Um, if you're using it as prescribed, the long-term effects should not, are not being shown to be very bad. And as always, it's always weighing the, the, the benefits and the, and the harms. Um, the benefits definitely outweigh what tiny minimal harms theoretically as maybe are there. Um, lots of people need those amphetamines for a variety of reasons. And so if you're getting them for, for something that you need, then by all means you should be taking it. But again, talk to your doctor. Uh, but this is not one where I would, we, we've stopped or have been panicking about their use because of these or ignoring you know, possible long-term use. It's studied very well. Next question, Santhoth Bodu. Why is eating mostly processed food bad for your health? Well, it's a, you know, tons of processed foods are a way to cram tons of calories in more than you think you're getting. Um, the more processed it is, the more refined it is, the easier it is to get too much. Um, with respect to processed meats, there's some epidemiologic evidence where people will say uh, it's, it's, it's unhealthy. I've blogged about this. I've written about it in the New York Times. We even had healthcare triage on meat. Um, and did we, has that one gone up yet? That's gone up, right? The meat one? Maybe we didn't. Crap, so many good episodes we need to do. Um, so no, you know, it's like, it's, it's even the most heavily processed meats, the, there's not a ton of convincing evidence that they're terribly damaging. Um, and, and if it is, it's in huge quantities. Um, and even then, it's a tiny relative increase in harms, not some massive absolute increase. Um, and so, you know, mostly I would say the problem with processed food is it's an easy way to eat unhealthy in general. Um, it's an easy way to eat too much. Uh, it's an easy way to get lots of things you don't necessarily need. Um, and we're going to have an upcoming episode, I think, on nutrition recommendations based on my recent New York Times piece on that, so you can watch more in the future. Next question. Lenka Svobovda, Svod, Svodova. Which SPF factor should I use if I live in the UK and how often should I apply it if it's 20 degrees Celsius and sunny? I've been told buying SPF 50 sunscreen is pointless. Thank you. You've been told that by healthcare triage. We've done an episode on this. I'm absolutely positive of it. So, um, and you also you know, screwed me up here because 20 degrees Celsius, you know I live in a place with Fahrenheit. Um, so I'm trying to do the math in my head and failing and it doesn't 70. matter. 70. Awesome. It, the temperature doesn't matter. The temperature's irrelevant. It's how much sun there is. That's the first thing. So it doesn't even matter that I couldn't immediately tell you what 20 degrees Celsius is. Are you out in the sun? You're getting UV rays. In fact, the most burned I've ever been was skiing because all of the light was reflecting off the snow too and I was getting huge doses of it. In fact, two of my kids recently got terribly burned while skiing because we were not vigilant enough about it in the, uh, in the, in the snow and the cold weather. It's the sun. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, yes, anything above SPF 30 starts to get ridiculous, as we said in the healthcare triage episode. SPF 30 is like 94% effective. SPF 50 or 60 is probably like 95 or 6% effective. It's all minutia. What matters is how much. And I don't want to spend the next 10 minutes redoing that healthcare triage video. So links will be down below. Find it, search it, learn how to put on sunscreen effectively. But yes, you absolutely need sunscreen if you're out in the sun, and SPF 50 probably is you know, more than you need. Next question, and we're probably running out of time here, but Camille on Hound, what does the research show for long-term risks associated with secondhand smoke exposure? For someone who's heavily exposed during childhood, is there any way to mitigate those risks as an adult? We don't have randomized controlled trials for this again, because of course it would be completely unethical to expose kids to secondhand smoke and then see how different amounts and when we stopped it affected their lungs. It's not going to happen. Most of the effects are short term that have been looked at uh, with respect to affecting breathing issues like asthma. And of course, the second you stop exposing kids, they get them better. Um, so, so stopping at any time is better than not. Um, but are there long term effects? Maybe. I wish we had better data. Uh, but that's unfortunately where we are. We're probably out of time, so I'm gonna go speed round for these last three questions I have. Question 20, Jack Cooper, what is being done to address publication bias by the pharmaceutical industry? Not enough, not enough. We require people to sort of establish their, uh, or at least most reputable journals require people to, to state their financial conflicts of interest. That's a start, um, but still too many get left out. More importantly, we ignore all the other kinds of conflict of interest, uh, academic and professional and ideological conflicts of interest. So not enough. Next, last two questions. 
Question from Mackenziek. Regarding diet soda, is there any danger to drinking it in larger amounts, not the aspartame? You know, I think there's some, you know, you always get those, uh, you know, school, you know, what are they called, science fairs where they put the soda on the teeth and it decays the teeth or decays something. Yeah, you know, soaking anything in an acid for too long is bad. Um, brush your teeth after you drink. Um, you know, I don't think that they're doing other, you know, even the studies of like bone issues, that they all pan out, they don't show any real problems. However, I think in general, don't drink anything in crazy amounts, everything in moderation. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It probably leads to a bad diet, but it's not like it, there's no study showing that it's going to give you cancer or anything else. So that, that's my quick answer. I've also got a note here to say that I was wrong before. Mark is not impersonating a lawyer. So the lawyer, the, uh, Stan the lawyer is telling me that Mark was not impersonating a lawyer and we don't want Mark to sue us. So that Mark was not. Last question. Maris Ionut, wow. Maris Ionut Myheta. How healthy is honey in reality? Is it actually as good for you as it is made out to be? <laughs> Who's making it out to be? Honey is like, I don't know. Honey is like anything else is a sweetener. Use it in moderation. Um, honey for babies is terrible. Um, they get botulism. I'm not kidding. Infantile botulism. Saw a case of it almost every year that I was a resident. Leads to kids being in the intensive care unit. They should not get honey. Um, for the rest of the world, once you're outside of that period, um, I don't think it's any better for you or worse for you. The idea that local honey cures your allergies is a myth. Read my books. Um, but is it like, is it better for you or worse for you than, than sugar or anything else? No, there are no miracle things. If something was a miraculous, awesome, going to cure you of everything, I swear to you, we would have an episode on it. You would be hear people screaming it from the rooftops and everybody would know it. They'd also find a way to charge you a billion dollars for it because they would make it a drug. Having said that, it's not bad for you, so there's no reason to truly avoid it either. Thank you for watching Healthcare Triage Live. Please subscribe to the show um, down below. We, you know, we always appreciate the subscriptions. Please continue to watch us, uh, tweet at us, you know, follow us, do everything else. Follow us on Twitter. Um, tell us how we think we're doing. Remember, we'll be here next week as well. Start putting your questions soon, if not now. Um, into next week's episode. Uh, there will be like a splash screen and a, probably a link you can find it. You can start adding your questions now and perhaps we'll get to them next week. You can always treat us, tweet us at hashtag, gosh, tweet us at hashtag HCT questions where we will also be sort of collecting those for the future. Um, our merch is available at uh, dftba.com and we appreciate you buying the poster or the mugs. Keep doing that. It allows me to have once in a while a coffee. I really do appreciate that. Um, so uh, that's all. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week.